Hello, I'm Robert Griffin, the Executive Minister here at the Sunshine Cathedral in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I want to thank you for joining us for worship via the internet today. And if you are ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, let me personally invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We also invite you to join us on our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter. But for this moment, let's go inside and see what exciting worship opportunity lay in store for us. Our first reading is from the book of Revelation. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs, in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, so that there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and the other angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading is a reading from the Gospel according to Luke. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, who has looked with favor on the lowliness of a marginalized person. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Divine mercy is for those who seek God from generation to generation. God has shown strength and has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Um, you know, from the readings and from uh, the anthem and from the opening hymn, you might think today has something to do with Mary. You're partly right. Uh, yesterday, in fact, was the feast day of the Assumption of Mary. And if you are from a high church Anglican tradition, or if you're from the Eastern Orthodox tradition or Roman Catholic tradition, you might be thinking, yay, they didn't forget. And if you're anyone else, you might be thinking, what? Um, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, it was the feast day of the Assumption of Mary, which is uh, the, the legendary account of how Mary, sort of like the uh, prophet Elijah, uh, is said to have somehow crossed the veil between this world of existence and the next without having to take that pesky step of dying that the rest of us have to do. She was just a sort of assumed body and soul into the next life. Uh, that, that doctrine became codified a uh, long, long, long time ago in 1950. And so um, I, I don't know that all Christians have always, uh, have always held that belief, but some do, and, and we're celebrating uh, the, the tradition but in our own way, of course, as we do. The first reading we heard today was from my favorite work of historical political sci-fi fiction, the book of Revelation. 
It's, it's true. I, I, if you've taken my New Testament classes, you know that I always present Revelation as if it were political dinner theater, and I think it was. Uh, it, that it has a, a, a message uh, meant, to, uh, meant to sort of bring comfort to hurting people, to embolden frightening people, to give people a catharsis. And so the imagery is very, uh, it's very dramatic and dynamic and exciting and relevant to what's going on in those people's lives at the time. It's really not about uh, the future. It's about what the people living at that time are experiencing, and it's being described in very vivid ways. It almost didn't make it into the canon of Scripture because uh, we, sometimes we treat the Bible as if it floated down from a cloud fully written, and that's not what happened. It's, it spans continents and languages and over a thousand years, and councils argued over what would, what would go in and what would be left out. Revelation almost didn't make the cut because people argued that it would just scare people, that the imagery was too vivid, it was too odd, and that people, if they took it too literally, they would, you know, it would just mess them up. And so other people said, no, no one would take that mess literally, leave it in. And uh, so we see political processes don't always work out for the best uh, results. <laughs> but it's a great literature, but it has been terribly misused, which is one of the reasons we have to reclaim it. Well, in the section we heard today from chapter 12, the text shows a woman adorned with stars and the sun and the moon. And the image is borrowed from the book of Genesis, from uh, Joseph's dream, where he dreams that the heavenly bodies bow down to him, which makes me believe that... Uh, Joseph might have been gay. I mean, with that sort of ego and uh, thinking that bodies would bow down to his body, I think that he must have been a young gay man. But scholars haven't, haven't made that clear yet, so that's just my, my thing for now. But that, that imagery of the heavenly bodies bowing down, that is, that is uh, being borrowed here in Revelation, while these heavenly bodies become the clothing that this woman, this unnamed woman, by the way, uh, is adorned with. She is often considered to be Mary, the mother of Jesus. But of course, Mary never ran from a dragon or literally wore stars for jewelry. But then, as we've discussed, Revelation isn't about the imagery being literal. In fact, over and over, I saw portents, I had a vision, I, I had a dream. I mean, they make it, the writer makes it clear over and over. This stuff isn't, uh, isn't exactly as we're saying it. This, these things represent something else. New Testament scholars, including, as it turns out, Roman Catholic Bible scholars, tend to understand the woman in Revelation as the first century Jewish community out of which came the central figure of the movement that would come to be called Christianity. The early church was persecuted, and so the drama outlined in Revelation chapter 12 is a story about the church or the group of people that would later be called the church confronting and hiding from and working against Roman domination. Rome is the dragon. The Roman Empire, the strongest, most powerful country on the planet, is the dragon. And the dragon pursued and persecuted the followers of Jesus. And it tried to extinguish the movement and the message that Jesus gave and inspired by executing Jesus and other leaders of the movement. But we are told that God raised Jesus to eternal life and significance, that somehow Golgotha failed, that this brutality that the Romans were known for of crucifying those people who were seditious or who somehow in any way opposed Roman authority, they were crucified. Runaway slaves, uh, rebels, they were crucified uh, by the thousands sometimes. And this, this fate befell Jesus, and it was supposed to just be the end of that but it failed, and that's the message of resurrection. And so, so the, the writer of Revelation is reminding us that, that, this, that this infant that was born from this woman is raised uh, to eternal life, the woman being the community he came out of. Now, the, the writer also mentions Archangel Michael, which in our day and age kind of sounds a little new agey, but it had a different meaning back then. Archangel Michael was the legendary defender of Israel, and by extension then, the Jesus movement, which was still largely Jewish. And so, so the writer imagines that Archangel Michael, the defender of the community, will help defeat the dragon, the Roman Empire, by helping the movement survive and outlive the empire that tried to destroy it. The story is a Christianized retelling of the Greek myth 
about the goddess Leto. And in that myth, the goddess Leto is running and hiding from the angry goddess Hera. But Leto is helped by her lover Zeus. Now, P.S., Hera is also Zeus's wife, which is why she's so angry, just so you know. So, she's, so Hera is chasing Leto, who is pregnant with Zeus's child, the sun deity and healer, Apollo. And so the deity Zeus rescues uh, Leto, helps her find a safe place so that she can have this son of the most powerful deity, the deity of healing and, and light. The writer of Revelation apparently took that old story, adapted it for his community to suggest that the kingdom of God that Jesus preached and represented would outlast the Roman Empire. The second reading this morning is from Luke's Gospel, where the female star of that story really is Mary, and she sings a song of praise. We hear it usually during the fourth Sunday of Advent, as Deacon Ed reminded me this morning, but <laughs> it's good year round. You can use it anytime. And so we hear Mary singing this morning, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, who has looked with favor on the lowliness of a marginalized person. This is an unwed teenage mother living in an occupied territory. This is, this is a person from a peasant class. This is an illiterate person. This is someone who is a quarter of a step above the slave class. And for her to dare to imagine that God even knows who she is, much less favors her, is incredibly empowering. And so she says, I magnify the one who has looked with favor on the lowliness of a marginalized person. God has shown strength and has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things. Like the first reading, a woman is standing up to injustice. This time, by speaking out against it, by affirming that God will not and cannot abandon those who suffer, and that God is justice love. Now, we've all heard that God is love, and when we hear that, maybe we think of something sort of warm and cuddly and fuzzy, like, 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 like the foam on top of root beer, that is just something sweet and syrupy, and God is love. But the prophetic tradition says that God is an active love, a justice-seeking love, a world-transforming love. The love that God is is justice love. And so she affirms that divine justice love will always be at work in the hearts of righteous people to work to make life more fair for all people. Luke imagines Mary declaring that God doesn't want some to thrive while others struggle. God wishes to lift up the lowly, to feed the hungry, and to show favor to those whom unjust systems have marginalized. But what we know is that what God does for us, God does through us. Wow, a lot of you have been here before. That what God does for us, God does through us. Our hands are God's hands. So for God to want to do something is to say that God needs us to do it. We remember that Jesus grows up to teach about God's kingdom, a non-kingdom, an anti-empire, where the last are first and the first are last, where generosity and peace and compassion and fairness are the rules of life, where everyone shares in prosperity, where the hurting are healed and those once called lowly are lifted up. Jesus' mother, according to Luke, imagines that God is justice love. Jesus himself, according to the Gospels, believes that God is justice love. But as radically new as these ideas sound even today, the truth is that the message that God is justice love and that this justice love is something we are to put into action, that message is one that Jesus inherited from the prophetic tradition. In stories about Jesus, we see him bringing the message of the prophets to life. One of the prophets who seemed to influence Jesus 
was the prophet Amos. Amos was a tree farmer. Don't you love, I just love that it's the tree farmers and the fishers and the, and the artisans and the nobodies and the slaves and the, and the women and the children. These are always the people that you, every once in a while a queen or you know, every once in a while a general, but, uh, but 97% of the time, and you do know that 84% of all statistics are made up on the spot to make a point, but still, like 97% of the people mentioned in scripture are from the lower rung. And so here's Amos, a tree farmer, who just shows up in Samaria one day and starts preaching. He's one of those guys, just shows up and starts, starts preaching at you. He's, he's sort of the, the precursor of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Knock, 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 I got a word for you. He did, that was Amos. Still had some leaves from, the, from his trees on him. He, knock, knock, I got a word for you. Samaria, Samaria was a big city in Israel. And his message to them was one of economic justice. He's in the big thriving city of the big thriving kingdom and he's speaking to the elites of that city talking about economic justice. You know he was well received, right? They applauded him when he talked. No. And it was during a time when the ruling class was doing very well and the super rich were getting even richer and the lower classes were struggling more and more. And Amos dared to say, this is not what God would want. This is not justice love. He wasn't saying that the rich should give to charity. He didn't need to say that. Amos is from a religious tradition that teaches we should all share what we have so that all basic needs can be met. The gospel showed Jesus telling a rich young man to give all he can to the poor. And it says he went away sad because he had a lot of stuff. He knew he could give more, and he didn't want to do that. But it also shows Jesus praising a poor wi widow for giving all she can, just two little coins. So the act of generosity isn't about your income level. We're all supposed to share what we can and what we have. Everyone is meant to be generous. But more than sharing some of our good fortune, Amos is saying that systems that privilege some haves while creating a vast collection of have-nots is contrary to God's desire. God dreams of a fairer sharing of resources. Amos, like Jesus hundreds of years later, is offering a picture of the realm of God, a realm where the last are first and the first are last, which is to say there aren't distinctions of hierarchy and class. We all have value. We all have something to share. And we are all appreciated for who we are and what we bring to the table. And so Amos is imagining a world and says this is actually God's dream where those who are pretty lucky care about those who are not currently doing as well so that everyone is okay all the time. In Amos chapter 2, Amos says that the elites of Samaria trample the poor. In chapter 4, he says they oppress the poor and crush the needy. In chapter 5, he tells the ruling class that they're pushing aside the needy. In chapter 6, he accuses the well-to-do of not having compassion for the poor, of not even caring that people are suffering. And then he stops preaching and goes to meddling, not that he's sugar-coated much so far. Amos tells religious people, religious folk, y'all, it was fine when he was telling the unwashed masses, masses in, the, in, the, in, the, in the square that, you know, that they weren't doing right, but he's now telling religious folk, if you want to get into trouble, try to tell religious folk something. I have discovered in my career, he goes to telling religious folk how to do stuff, and that gets him in a lot of trouble. In fact, the priest and the king later conspire against him because of that. Amos tells religious people that God isn't impressed with how well they keep their traditions or how perfectly they perform their rituals. Instead, Amos insists that God would prefer that we care about the poor, the sick, and the hurting. We can celebrate however we wish, of course. We, we're going to bring out the high drag when the, when the weather gets cooler. And, uh, you know, we've got the sterling silver and brass stuff for communion and the beautiful windows and the, and the expensive organ and the world-class musicians. It's good to have a big party. It's good to celebrate. It's good to bring joy and peace into people's lives that way. We can celebrate however we wish, and we can do it as grandly as we can afford. But if we use worship rituals in place of actually caring for our neighbors, then our worship rings hollow and our faith isn't making a positive difference in the world.
It's not... <laughs> it's deeds, not creeds, that Amos says God is looking for. It's not about your favorite hymn or even your favorite Bible verse. It's not about if you worship on Saturday or Sunday. It's about how we treat our neighbors, that pesky golden rule that Jesus tried to drive home. And so in the fifth chapter of the book of Amos, the prophet speaks to those who are comfortable and who worship in nice places without ever being confronted or challenged in those places. And he tells them, this is what God would say to them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's what God wants. And for Amos, righteousness is justice. The waters of justice and the stream of righteousness are the same thing. When Amos is preaching all this justice stuff, he knows that he just can't hit them with that right off. He's got to set it up a little bit or they'll just walk away. So he starts talking about how their neighbors and enemies should do better. And oh, they agree. He says Damascus is wrong to ignore the poor. You know what? That's right. Damascus has never been any good. I, I won't go to Damascus. Oh, those people are horrible. And then he says Gaza is wrong to marginalize the poor. Well, I could have told you the Gazanians were no good. They've, never been, they've always been trash, the Gazanians, please. And then he says, Tyre is wrong to keep the poor down while the rich just get richer. Tyre's always been a horrible place. Mean people in Tyre. Edom also doesn't treat the hardworking poor fairly. Amen. Preach. You're doing some good stuff there, right there, Amos. And then, oh, he gets two of their favorite enemies. The Ammonites and the Moabites are not doing enough for the sick and the poor. Well, they're just demons walking around the earth anyway. Preach! <laughs> And then he says, Judah, your cousins, your nearest neighbor, and you've had some conflicts with them too, they're not doing enough for the marginalized and the suffering. No, they sure aren't, Amos. So glad you noticed. And then he says in the second chapter of the book, and you, Israel, you are no better than these others. You trample the poor into the dust, and you push the afflicted out of your way. Who asked him anything? Who invited this guy here? He was doing good a minute ago. Now he is all wrong. Get him up out of here. It would be like a preacher in our own day calling out the wrongdoings of Iran. Ooh, Iran, that mean old Iran, hateful Iran. And North Korea, ooh, the evil empire. And of Venezuela, and of Colombia, ooh, you know, they've got, they've got, they bring stuff in here we don't want. And of Russia, oh yeah, it's a dangerous place in Russia. And then saying, oh, but guess what, U.S.? Your hands aren't entirely clean either. And that is what Amos would say to us. We have the ability to send every, honestly every, good student to college. So why do we make it economically impossible for many to continue their education? We could make, yes. We could make sure that every citizen has medical coverage, but we actually fight against it. Not throw up our hands because we can't figure out how, but we just don't want it, and we fight against it. We could make sure that those who don't have enough eat to eat get more food, but we try to cut aid to the hungry. We, would prom we could promise every senior citizen that they will spend their final years with dignity and some comfort, but instead we fight to make them work longer before they can retire, and we try to gamble with their medical coverage. I guess thinking that we will never ourselves see 70s and 80s, never thinking ourselves that maybe it would be hard to work some jobs into your 70s, and maybe not ever thinking that one day after a lifetime of working, we might just deserve some pleasure and ease in the final couple of decades. I don't know what we're thinking when we say, let's don't help people who could use the help. But Amos would, said, would say to us, if that's what you think, think again, especially if you dare to call yourself the people of God. Amen. Amos told the prosperous people of Samaria, you can do better. 
You're doing, a, you're doing well for yourselves, and you live in a country that, that in, in a nation, in a world that's, that, that, that has set things pretty up pretty well for you, but you can do better as people of faith. If you want to be godly, you must do better. You can't be content to grow your finances and then blame the poor for their plight or ignore them altogether. You, you have to be more generous, more compassionate, more caring than that if you want to call yourselves the people of God. It's not enough to say, but I know all the words to the creeds, and I sing really loud on the hymns, and I am nice to my buddies. Well, that's all good, but it's not good enough. Now be clear, the Bible is never against people prospering, but the Bible repeatedly challenges those who say, I've got mine, now let everyone else just try a little harder. You may believe that, and you may can even present evidence for why that is right, but that is contradictory to the consistent message of our scriptures. That is contrary to the message of the prophetic tradition. It is contrary to the message of Jesus and the kingdom of God. The story of Mary this morning has her praising God because God wants all people to be cared for. I think it's funny that some of us have very warm, fuzzy feelings for Mary. Venerate her, pray to her, practically worship her, but would bristle to hear that Mary was praising God because God wanted the poor cared for. People like her. People who had unplanned pregnancies. People who couldn't read. People who didn't have a lot of resources. People who didn't have a lot of power. People who weren't highly regarded. And yet this Mary that we have made into a cosmic queen was a peasant, unwed teenage mother daring to say, God has noticed me, and God wants people like me to be okay. Let our veneration of Mary follow her prayer. She affirmed that God, and by extension God's people, must be concerned for the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you, which isn't to say, so ignore them. No, the poor you will always have with you, so you always have work to do. And Jesus risked his own life and lost it, preaching about a kingdom of God that would look nothing like the militaristic, the militaristic, the militaristic Roman Empire. I'm not going to make any commentary. I just want you to hear the word militaristic. Roman Empire that invaded other countries and privileged the elites while ignoring the desperately poor. The Roman Empire who always had money to invade one more country, but not enough money to feed or house or give medicine to its own poor. I'm only talking about Rome, but shame on Rome. <laughs> The late New Testament scholar Marcus Borg said, Jesus wasn't talking about how to be good within the framework of a domination system. Jesus was a critic of the domination system. That's what the kingdom of God is. It is a criticism of the domination system. What it means to be Christian is to follow Jesus and the justice-seeking prophetic tradition he embodied. And so part of what it means to be Christian is to not only share our good fortune, but to work to end systems whereby others are kept from enjoying the same comforts that we might take for granted. To follow Jesus is to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. To be followers of Jesus is to be worshipers of justice love, which we call God. And to be worshipers of justice love is to be workers of justice love in our world. Will you covenant with me this morning? Will you promise yourself and the God of your understanding? Will you covenant this morning to be workers of justice love in the world? If so, say yes. Better. Let's sing it. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. That is Sunshine Cathedral's Magnificat, and this is the good news. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.